I am a heterodox economist, and by that I mean I'm not a mainstream neoclassicist. Neoclassical economics dominates the teaching of economics in universities around the world. I was trained as a neoclassicist in my undergraduate degree, but I've since um, moved my analytical frameworks considerably and I'm quite critical of what I was trained as an orthodox economist. My field of research is energy. But having said that, I have spent many years um, with a sideline debating this nature of what is heterodox economics, what is neoclassical economics, etc. And, um, and this is where this sort of paper came from. I edited a book with two colleagues, um, a handbook. Um, of heterodox economics that was published at the beginning of 2018 and that was a culmination of three years of work with colleagues and it was about bringing on a new generation. Um, we've got you know well-known names but we've also got a lot of emerging scholars that need opportunities to get their work published and that was the culmination of that work and you will be part I'm sure of future publication similarly. But in 2017, Geoffrey Hodgson, um, very, very important, renowned institutionalist economist, um, presented a paper in the middle of the year to an international conference in, I think it was Italy, oh, sorry, the Netherlands, then subsequently presented it at Cambridge and then a short time later at another conference. So there's been three international conferences that he's made a number of claims. And when I first read this paper, I was shocked. And I was shocked about the scholarship. And I have no qualms in saying this paper is poor scholarship. And I will explain during my presentation today why I've come to that conclusion. But no one responded to these claims. And it also included a very personal attack on Fred Lee. Um, Fred has really um, been one of the leading figures in heterodox economics over the last 30 years and died um, a short time ago. So he's not able to defend himself. So. Um, Perhaps foolishly, I decided to write a response to Hodgson. And I was nervous about it because he is a very well-known figure and I was putting my head up there criticising someone who is not normally criticised. So it's led me to this paper. This is what I want to run through with you today. And I am nervous about it because I've been told by Mark that you are scary smart as a group, very, very smart. So I expect a robust discussion at the end. This is what I want to cover. I want to talk about why respond. Why bother responding, notwithstanding what my introductory marks have said. Then I want to talk through his approach and his assumptions, because essentially he attacks <coughs> heterodox economics and says um, we're pretty poor, pretty poor and haven't achieved very much. He's got three substantive criticisms, which I will um, go through, and he proposes four strategies to address the weaknesses that he identifies. And then I want to come to sort of some broader implications and concluding remarks, because this really points to how do we progress as a group of heterodox scholars into the future, <coughs> given that we are being attacked by one of our own. So why respond to his claims? Well, I think there are 10 pretty fundamental reasons. The, his criticisms are not trivial. Um, but in fact, they become more significant as a group of criticisms. It's not just a singular criticism, it's multiple criticisms. Secondly, he is very, very influential. I heard him speak at Cambridge in November when I was there. Um, and Tony Lawson made the comment, I think, when he introduced him that he'd written like 19 books and another two are about to be published. And in fact, he has generated a book from this very poor, sloppy paper. 
that will be published in September. So guess who's going to be reviewing his book? Um, but he is very influential as in terms of institutional economists and evolutionary economics. He's very, very well known. He's had a very prestigious academic career, I think, for the last 40 years. Um, he's been very um, influential in the European Association for Evolutionary Political Economy and WINRA, which is the world, I'm going to get the name wrong, world international network for institutional research. Third, he reiter reiterates past criticisms of heterodoxy, but he doesn't actually acknowledge a lot of the debates that have been generated by those criticisms. His criticisms um, intersect with long-standing debates that have been amongst the heterodox economics community for quite some time, but again, he doesn't acknowledge those debates. He judges the success of heterodox economics using mainstream economics criteria. And mainstream economics criteria is exactly what has marginalised heterodox economists. And I'm talking about high level journal rankings, like the American Economic Review, other, and other similar journals. I'm talking about institutional appointments at the American Ivy League universities. These are the sort of measures that he uses to judge heterodoxy by, but we don't get a look in in those institutions, nor do we get a look in into those mainstream economic journals because that's not what we engage with. He also, um, and this is one of the sloppy things that he does in the paper, he by default assigns a very singular role, what I call an epistemological role, for the project of heterodox economics. And I think it's fair to say there are, across the community, there are multiple, multiple objectives um, of the project of heterodox economics. And it's not just about pluralism, but I'll come to that in more detail. His so-called strategies for heterodox economics to improve its quality, they're not new propositions, they're not novel. They've been around for decades. And the feasibility, as I'll explain, has waned considerably, um, particularly in this climate in which we all live in the higher education sector. He infers that um, all heterodox scholars are leftist, we're ideologically driven, but the mainstream are politically neutral. And that is just rubbish, absolute rubbish. Every school of economic thought reflects a particular, um, what, what I would call a particular political philosophy. Ideolo ideology and economics, every school of economic thought goes hand in hand. And there's been a lot of debate about that over the last few decades. Again, he does not acknowledge that. Um, he engages with a lot of debates um, of past and contemporary heterodoxy, including that about pluralism. And the fact that his criticisms have been presented, as I mentioned earlier, to a wide range of international audiences, they do demand a response. They do demand a rejoinder. Um, after I initially presented this paper, it has been posted online to the um, WEA's Economic Thought Journal and I thought naively that a lot of people would make comments. One person has commented in three months. I'm not sure they want to take Geoffrey Hodgson on. Okay, so what's his approach and assumptions, given he's very, very critical about what heterodox economics has achieved and the quality of um, its scholarship. He draws upon um, Philip Kitcher's work on the role of scientific communities in the development of science. And this is an, an interesting approach and I'll shortly take you through the elements of it. But he doesn't really justify why this is the particular approach 
but he um, infers that it is the only way to understand the development of any social science or any natural science, any science at all. And I think that needs to be questioned in itself. He suggests that um, social epistemology, which he defines as the collective acquisition of knowledge through, and I stress, social practices by a scientific community. He considers this as a really good framework to judge, to assess what heterodox economics has achieved. Because, and I quote, it highlights issues that may help explain its limited, limited cumulative advance and its waning influence. In other words, he's already suggesting that um, heterodox economics should have advanced quite considerably, notwithstanding the difficulties, it, it, um, it stands vis-a-vis -vis the mainstream, and its so-called waning influence. And waning influence is judged in terms of, guess what, appointments in those um, mainstream economics institutions and in high-ranking mainstream journals. How does he come to all of this? Well, he doesn't really set it out quite clearly in the paper, but this is what I've discerned in terms of his logic and assumptions. Scientific inquiry is socially embedded, and I think that's probably a reasonable um, starting point for all of us. There is some sort of community of interacting researchers that is required if inquiry if academic inquiry is going to be effective. Knowledge is advanced by institutionalised research communities through scrutiny, scrutiny of each other's work. Not acceptance, but scrutiny. In other words, debate, dialogue. And a scientific community, social relations and institutions will screen research, but that will depend on trust across the community but are vital for consensus so science can progress. In other words, we need consensus across this scientific community of interacting researchers if science is to progress. The social and material environment will impact on understanding and thus knowledge. The progress of science requires social institutions to establish consensus across a critical mass and expertise concentrations are necessary. Consensus will mean control by a group using so-called screening criteria, e.g. institutional affiliations or journal rankings. Screening criteria may be rough and ready, but necessary to process very complex and unwieldy amounts of knowledge and maintain boundaries of ex an expert scientific community. Now, some of those points overlap, but this starts to give you an idea of the framework that he applies. So if we are going to assess the validity of that framework and his conclusions, we need to see all these elements. And I point out that, sorry, do you want to ask? I didn't want to interrupt. I was just wondering, is he explicitly saying that or is this your interpretation? No, he doesn't explicitly say it, but if you go through each section of the paper, you find these elements. He doesn't set it out. As a, as a scholar, I would set out what my framework is, how I'm judging it, but he doesn't set it out clearly as this, but you can discern it through the sections of the paper. Okay. Now, much of those points, I, I would probably argue is quite logical, reasonable, if you assume that how, is how knowledge is advanced, and we need to have that debate how we think knowledge is created and advanced. But Hodgson does not situate his framework within that debate. What I think the application of that framework that I've outlined requires the identification of are those uh, one, two, three, four, six, seven elements. Members of the community of interacting researchers, the institutions, the social institutions supporting the interaction of researchers, the social and material environment of the community, the social institutions establishing consensus and expertise concentrations, members of the group whose role is to screen, 
to achieve consensus across the group, the form of consensus reach, the social practices, the screening criteria used to scrutinise work. I mention all of those because, and I will say this to every one of my students, right through to my PhD students, you set out a framework implicitly or explicitly and you don't address it, then it's poor scholarship. And this is why I have concluded Hodgson has undertaken poor scholarship because I can't find all of those elements in his argument. For me, the key issue fr arising from Hodgson's approach is what are the actual real world social practices, interactions and institutions that he applies to reach his conclusions of heterodoxy's limited progress and bearable esteem because of so-called poor quality. First substantive cr criticism is the failure to define the nature and scope of heterodox economics and thus its purpose, its project. Now I won't go through this in a lot of detail but essentially he focuses on the work of Fred Lee and the work of Tony Lawson and they've really led the debate about defining what is heterodox economics. Fred Lee's definition really focuses around what are the common characteristics across different schools of economic thought which make them distinct from mainstream. And some of those elements can be the use of open systems rather than closed systems. Now, Hodgson thinks that um, Fred Lee's definition reflects personal and political preferences. Um, uses so-called demarcation criteria, in other words, whether um, or not a school uses mainstream propositions or not, will define them as being heterodox or not. So already it's starting to come through. The first measure to judge is whether they use mainstream propositions or not. I don't use mainstream propositions, so according to that conclusion by Hodgson, I'd be regarded as heterodox. He also makes a claim that Fred Lee's definition does include a number of schools like Austrian economics or evolutionary economics. It's not correct. And if you go through the literature, you actually find that Fred Lee's included those schools. He also says that Fred's definition is deliberately constructed to be contrary to the mainstream. I think it's fair to point out the evolution of heterodox economics over time shows that a lot of heterodox scholars started out as wanting to distinguish themselves from the mainstream, as to be a voice of dissent. But it's evolved into something different. We can't just spend our lives critiquing the mainstream. We've actually got to move on and come up with more constructive suggestions and policy solutions. And you won't get those if you just spend your time critiquing the mainstream. I argue in the paper that um, Fred Lee's definition is not just a list of schools per se, but focuses on the combination of characteristics very inherent to all the schools, e.g. shared elements of difference from orthodoxy. I think also Lee's definition is very indicative of the theoretical and methodological breadth of the heterodox community. And a definition doesn't have to be exhaustive to actually be, to be coherent or credible. And Lee's definition actually points to the so-called social practices of pluralism, community, etc which have fostered the, um, the development of heterodoxy. And these I refer get back to Hodgson's framework, social practices, defining a community, but these are not considered. In fact, he overlooks them completely. He ignores all the heterodox journals, conferences, newsletters, publications, etc., that have occurred, the, the notion of heterodox activity over the years. He's equally critical of Tony Lawson. Now, I'm have no idea if any of you are familiar with um, Lawson's work. It's much more philosophical. And he sought some time ago, in, th in fact, in a quite seminal article in the Cambridge Journal of Economics to define what is heterodox economics. Not just in terms of the difference with the mainstream, but also 
how um, heterodox economic schools of thought differ amongst themselves. And it's more um, in terms of ontology. He sees the mainstream as having a far different ontology than heterodox economics. But Hodgson's discussion of Lawson's work, which, um, look, I'm not a philosopher, and Tunney's Lawson's work, it hurts my head to go through it and concentrate and understand it. I can understand it, but it's taken a lot of work. But this is just, the, the philosophical discussion is just non-existent or not recognised by um, Hodgson. In fact, what he reduces it down to is a binary in terms of whether a school of economic thought uses mathematics or not. Now, Lawson has been very, very critical of the mainstream's use of mathematics and basically says, look, it's used when it's not appropriate for the question to be answered. So if you're, according to um, Hodgson, if you use um, maths, you'd be um, considered by Lawson as mainstream. If you didn't use maths, um, you'd be considered by Lawson to be heterodox. Well, he also concludes that some mainstream icons could be considered heterodox according to this because they don't use mathematics and vice versa. Lawson has written quite significantly about this reduction down to a mathematical binary and said, that is not what I say. And it's been published quite extensively. Hodgson does not acknowledge Lawson's refutations. And again, I think that's poor scholarship. Now, what it, it, Hodgson claims in terms of this failure to define what the project of, of heterodox economics is, and thus its purpose, means there's some sort of schism, there's some sort of clash um, and contradictions between Lee's definition and Lawson's definition. They're complementary. It's like slicing something in two different ways. One is looking at the characteristics of so-called heterodox economic skills of thought, and one is looking at it in very much an ontological view of the difference with the mainstream. He also suggests that many economists do not self-identify as heterodox, but you know, most mainstream don't identify as mainstream either. I mean, we probably would call ourselves a post-Keynesian, or in my case, I'm this very lonely French-Australian version of a regulationist. Not uncritical, but... And I would put that first before I usually would say I was a heterodox economist. Um, He also suggests there's no consensus about purpose across heterodoxy in terms of theory, methodology, analytical focus, or policy prescriptions. In actual fact, there's quite a bit of scholarship talking about the convergences between schools or the interdisciplinarity that's been starting to occur. And it's documented going back to Phil O'Hara's work in 2007 and also by Fred Lee, but that is not mentioned at all by Hodson. His second substantive criticism <coughs> is that we need to take pluralism quite seriously. Now, this raises a fundamental issue for me. How is pluralism defined by Geoffrey Hodson? Well, he's very silent on that. But what can be discerned from the paper is two different views of pluralism he puts forward. First, as a form of diversity, so diversity of views, but um, it should be bounded. In other words, not everything can be included. There should be some sort of boundary drawn as to what reflects that diversity. He doesn't explain how those boundaries should be decided, but he does suggest that if you restrict the number of schools of economic thought that are included as part of pluralism, you'll get much more rigorous criticism leading to publishable arguments in those high quality, highly ranked journals. The other uh, view of pluralism he expressed is about engagement with the orthodoxy and other disciplines. 
I think this raises two interesting aspects because there's been a long-standing debate across the heterodox economics community. If we are going to promote pluralism within the discipline of economics, does that include neoclassicals? I think it should. I teach my student what neoclassical economics is about. I also teach them what institutional economics is about, what Marxian economics is about what classical political economy is. Because if you don't understand the neoclassical debate, you should understand the other debates as well. But engagement with the orthodoxy can mean two different things. You engage on their terms or you engage on neutral terms. And what he eventually proposals is heterodoxy should engage with orthodoxy on the terms of orthodoxy, in other words, in terms of the logic, the concepts, the assumptions of the orthodoxy. He suggests that um, our weak heterodox scholarship can be improved considerably with feedback from orthodox scholars. I'd add at this point, most orthodox mainstream scholars don't want to know, don't engage with heterodox scholars. Welcome to my world. For the last 10 years, I have been located in a building at the University of Sydney on the same floor as the School of Economics. I'm in the Department of Political Economy. It's separate from the School of Economics. My colleagues from the School of Economics do not even acknowledge me when I pass them in the corridor, let alone want to have a debate with me. We've moved to a new building. I'm now separated from them by a couple of floors. I've been on sabbatical, but I've been in a couple of occasions. I've been in the same lift as them going up to my new level. I don't exist. They look straight through me. How, come, how am I going to engage with someone and have dialogue if they don't even acknowledge that I exist? Anyway, um, the other point that I want to make here, though, is when we talk about pluralism, I think we've got to be careful not to confuse it with interdisciplinarity. You can have pluralism within economics, but interdisciplinarity, I think, raises a whole set of other issues in terms of the engagement, e.g., with sociology, with history, political science. I do a lot of work with colleagues in sociology. That, to me, is being interdisciplinary doesn't mean pluralism in economics. Hodgson's third substantive criticism is we lack expertise concentration, so our quality suffers. Now, this follows from his first two criticisms. And I'd add at this point, because heterodox scholars don't get jobs in mainstream departments, we're not concentrated. I'm in a very unique position at the Department of Political Economy. We're not big. I think at last count there was only 14 of us. We're quite diverse um, because we don't just include heterodox economic scholars, like some of my um, colleagues are post-Keynesians. We also have um, more uh, scholars of sociology. But I am in a unique position in a concentration of a group that we say we practice political economy. It's unusual. Most heterodox scholars are located <coughs> in business schools, management um, departments, even accounting, statistics, sociology, anthropology, even education. We're spread. We are not concentrated, which Hodgson argues you need that concentration if you're going to get debate, criticism, rigour across your work. But if we can't get the jobs in mainstream departments, how are we going to get those concentrations? He also suggests um, we disregard established journal rankings and citation impacts. I think this is a particularly unfair criticism. I will never be published in the American Economic Review. My research doesn't cover the sort of research that they regard as suitable for publication. 
but I publish in high impact journals, highly impact. I've just got a publication accepted for um, energy policy. It's a ranking of 4.1. I mean, that's brilliant in terms of my point of view, but he would not regard that as a highly ranked mainstream economics journal. It's too specialist. But he says, we disregard these established journal rankings and we should really lift our game and seek to publish. In other words, we have to switch our work around to be suitable to be published in mainstream journals. But these are the journals that have actually marginalised us because they don't accept us. Okay, I think I'm going to start running out of time. Is, going, is someone keeping a bit of a time on me? Am I going okay? Okay, thanks. Okay, so he pro proposes four alternative strategies. Look, two of them are a bit like setting up straw people. Um, but he sets up that there's, of the um, four strategies, there needs to be some basic criteria met if it's going to be viable. It's got to establish the raison d'etre of heterodox economics, in other words, its purpose, its project. It's got to encompass researcher incentives. In other words, it's got to be able to encourage early career researchers to want to be involved as heterodox scholars. It needs to provide quality control and it needs to ensure consensus across the group of researchers. In other words, his so-called success, successful strategy must overcome the alleged purpose, quality and consensus weaknesses of heterodox economics. I'd also add, throughout this paper, he assiduously avoids identifying himself, one, as an economist and two, as a heterodox economist, notwithstanding his background in terms of um, evolutionary economics, institutional economics and those heterodox associations. His first um, strategy is to create separate academic departments. Um, he cites the Australian example of my own department, but he makes no mention of its very difficult and unique history. <coughs> the ongoing struggle or the dilution of heterodox economics. Um, every 18 months to two years, there's another push to get rid of us, either to um, merge us into other departments or um, to basically cut out our programs. And it'll come from some part of the university. We've got a long-standing history that goes back to the 1970s and it means for those that are still in charge of the university, they see us more as political activists rather than academics. I mean, I don't go to work for political activism. I go to work because of academic scholarship and my teaching. Some of my colleagues, yes, are strongly um, active politically, but that doesn't take away from their contribution to academia. But that's how often we are perceived. When we were part of economics in the old business faculty, um, denied a lot of opportunities for promotion, research grants, and a whole lot of other opportunities, but we managed to survive. But it's been a very, very difficult time, and it's a unique set of circumstances, but there's no knowledge of that, or no recognition of that by Hodgson. So he suggests, um, okay, let's create separate academic departments. I think this ignores reality. Now, I'm not f as familiar with the French situation as Australia, but I do understand a few years back there was the opportunity to create some new focus within universities' education that would have meant more heterodox economics being taught and that Nobel laureate Tyrol wrote a letter and basically knocked it on the head. There's not the opportunity in terms of how it, universities are run, like large corporations. When my department was transferred into the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, our enrolments for students in our programs 
went through the roof. I nearly died when I started teaching at Sydney University. My first year class had 650 students in it. Now, in terms of enrolments in the social sciences, right across Australia, in, they've gone down considerably. And my enrolments, um, even though they're higher than they were when they were part of the Department of Economics, I'll go home to face probably about 450 or maybe 400 students in the first year class. It's pretty daunting, but they're big numbers. What has that meant? Big numbers? Ah, they pay fees. International students pay higher fees. Hi fee income, student fee income, means you can employ, employ more teachers to teach programs. That's the funding model. You don't get the enrolments, you don't get the money, the staff have got to be laid off. That's the reality in which I work. Hodson ignores that funding model just says, look, let's create a new separate academic department. You won't get a creation of a separate academic department. Departments now are run and created not on the creation of knowledge, but it's about student enrolments. And the way we're going in Australia is business are telling universities what graduates they want from what disciplines. And that's where effort is being put. Now he says, um, this is a, a risky and unproven option, but a, he cites the Australian example, we're proven, we do exist. Um, but he says it will not establish that project, that purpose of heterodox economics. But he doesn't mention anything about researcher incentives or quality control. And this is another weakness. When he sets up his strategy, and he's got his four criteria for a successful strategy, he does not systematically evaluate each of these strategies against those criteria. A second option, attain a position in a non-economics department. Well, guess where he's been located for 40 odd years in a business school, teaching management. He retired from one university and he's just taken another position in a business school in London. My, as I said, most heterodox scholars are not located in economics department and some are located in business schools. But guess what happens when you're in a business school? You're going to be judged by those mainstream um, criteria, journal rankings, higher level journal rankings. It won't lead to the embedding of, of heterodox content being taught. It'll be an individual scholar or a couple of scholars in a business school but it won't promote the teaching of heterodoxy. And it will not give the density or the so-called concentration that Hodgson says we need if we're going to have rigour, scrutiny, and we're going to screen in terms of the quality of our work. So it doesn't meet his first criteria for viability and obviously doesn't meet the other three. This one I find probably a little bit offensive. He says, oh look, third strategy, organise around an approach that's got success and potential. And guess the two he cites, post-Keynesian, inspired by post-Keynesians, modern monetary theory and Minsky's work. Now I've got nothing against Randy Ray or Bill Mitchell, they're good friends of mine. It's one way of looking at the world. It's not the only way of looking at the world. Mincy's work is really interesting. It's not what I prefer to use to explain social reality. Um, but anyway, he cites these as examples of, look, pick a winner and just go for broke with that one. But he claims it'll only succeed through publications in leading highly ranked mainstream journals or quick establishment of the own your own influential journal. Guess what Hodgson has done over the years? Establish his own journal called the Journal of Institutional Economics. Well, it's really hard to establish a new journal. Publishers um, expect you to bring some learned society or organisation with that journal to give it sufficient um, subscription potential through institutions and individuals. 
And you've also got to acknowledge there's a huge discourse gap out there that's not covered by an existing journal. It is not easy to achieve. Also, I think proposing that you only go with one approach, I think this is like exactly what the mainstream's practice is, is monoism. Mono, monoism. Um, it's, it's selecting one approach and basically relegating every, any other approach to some second order intellectual activity. He's silent on how uh, the criteria to determine what's that successful approach or future potential of approach that you should select and who's going to decide. Who's going to deem whether one approach is appropriate or not. It creates a real division which is contrary to pluralism within economics, I think. Um, And as I said, you know, one approach is assessed as the most le legitimate, but the others are relegated to um, some sort of second order intellectual inquiry. Jack Reardon from the US, who's the um, editor of the International Journal for Pluralism in, I always get the title wrong, International Journal for Pluralism e Economics Education. Um, has done a lot of work and has argued quite, I think, clearly, those leading mainstream journals, as I mentioned, they're not accessible unless the approach is made subservient to that mainstream logic, concepts, lexicon, etc. And as I mentioned, the establishment of new journals is very, very difficult to achieve. And, and why would the mainstream pay attention? Why would they pay attention to a new heterodox journal? His fourth strategy, which um, <coughs> is not surprising, he says, look, take privileged institutions, take institutions as the focus of your analytical <coughs> concern and analyse it in one of two ways, from a range of disciplinary perspectives or by using prominent mainstream techniques and approaches. Hodson's uh, focus, analytical focus, has been institutions. So why am I not surprised he proposed that? Um, in other words, relegate all those other heterodox emphases or concerns like history or political decisions or path dependency or uncertainty ideology, relegate those. But it's not clear how privileging one analytical concern would actually ensure all those things that Hodgson says that we currently lacked, like expertise concentration, like quality, like how do you get your screening criteria, etc. But there's no mention of any of that. Of his four alternative strategies, my core criticism is there's no common objective there to achieve heterodoxy um, quality or improvement to overcome those weaknesses that he suggests, and he doesn't as, um, assess the four strategies against his own criteria. So that's why I think it's weak, very weak scholarship. Doesn't use his own framework, doesn't assess each strategy against his own criteria. But nevertheless, I still think his criticisms do need to be addressed. Now, I've probably said enough about, you know, his use of mainstream standards and um, criteria. They're the very ones that have marginalised heterodoxy, but that's what he's proposing to use to improve the quality of our work. I think his strategies overlook the contemporary realities of employment and funding in higher education. I think also he overlooks historical, geographic and cultural specificities for each school of economic thought. They're different. And they're also different in Europe they're different in the US, they're different in the UK, and they're different in Australia. I think, and this is where the debate's now, I think, got to move, rather than just critiquing Hodson, it's now got to move, is what do we do as heterodox scholars? I think we do need a diverse set of strategies, and it cannot be um, structured around 
one strategy or an individual attaining a position in an academic institution. It's got to be commitment by scholars across disciplines, across institutions. There's been a lot of activity over the past 20 years by heterodox economists outside of the individual appointment, outside the individual institution in terms of publications, associations, journals, conferences, publishers, study programs and an online presence. That's got to continue but probably take new forms. But the core thing, and I, I think this is where a project is starting to emerge with one of my co-editors from the handbook that was published last year, is that we start setting up a new project. How do we judge the quality, success or progress of heterodox economics? It has evolved, it is multifaceted, it is multi-layered. Many would argue that the project of heterodox economics, because it encompasses so many different schools of economic thought, the project's different. Is it to construct an alternative paradigm? I wouldn't argue that, some of my colleagues would. Is it to promote tolerance and application of ec pluralism with economics? I would argue that is one of its roles. Does it have a single role? And I would argue it's got multiple roles or multiple parts of the project. Some of my colleagues would argue differently. Is it to provide alternative understandings or to provide a robust critique of mainstream economics? Probably both. Or is it to teach economics through a range of methodological approaches? That's what many of us practice if we have the opportunity. But again, that is one aspect of what the project of heterodox economics should be. I don't think we should spend the next 20 years navel gazing and going back and critiquing the mainstream. We've got to move it forward. I'll leave it there and I look forward to the critique of my paper. <laughs> Thank you. We wanted to present uh, a very broad critique uh, about the two papers that we read. Uh, we, what we do, did mainly was uh, propose some key topics that we want to share and uh, debate with you and with all of you guys, as this is a topic that we think it concerns everyone. <laughs> Uh, in our course specifically, so uh, just to put a face to the to the guy that uh, we are referring to, this is Geoffrey Hodgson. Uh, he is uh, uh, the editor in chief of the Journal of Institutional Economics. Uh, he has is author of uh, more than. 150 articles, 16 books, 80 articles, that this is uh, mostly from his website. Uh, and he's a professor from the University of Hertfordshire. He mainly comes from the institutional uh, institutionalism tradition, uh, mostly Thurston Beblin, the theory of leisure class, that is his book. Uh, so just to... Uh, and um, just also to give you a little insights on the paper from a different perspective from our perspective uh, these are mainly the the objectives or the main uh, things that he wanted to brought up to the uh, critique to the heterodox uh, in his words meaning and potential of heterodox economics is a label of organized of being an organized uh, yeah label to opposition to the mainstream uh, so he wants to address if pluralism is desirable, but he says uh, there is a need of some consensus. Uh, he says that uh, uh, this, this paper would uh, help to appreciate why the heterodox project has not made progress. He says it like this. And then uh, he says that it's important through this paper to show controversy over its nature and unresolved, uh, yeah, his unresolved nature and without clear consensus over the people that is uh, uh, labeling is th themselves as heterodox. And uh, this is the are the main sections of the paper as we've seen before uh, with uh, Lynn's paper. But uh, just to tell you how it goes now, meaning and nature, he 
he criticized it from the point of view of Tony Lawson and Frederick Lee, uh, then uh, defines the framework from sharing a reason, uh, raison d'être, that uh, we'll talk about it a little bit more in this, and the role of pluralism. Uh, then uh, he he stresses the progress of social sciences in his point of view, how social sciences should progress uh, or would progress. Uh, and then he stresses the point of the screening by a scientific community, so the legitimacy uh, role. And then um, he uh, stresses this part about the pathology of heteroxy. And in the conclusion, he uh, defines these strategies that uh, uh, Lean already talked about. Um, just to broadly assess the paper, uh, we chose to, to, to see some pros and cons of it. And we thought it was important to stress that um, is a critique, and a critique opens a debate. So that's why we have this uh, paper of Lean. Um, uh, the it's it's a review of relevant literature from the mainstream fr from the heterodox perspective, uh, people that is consider themselves uh, considering considering themselves heterodox are quoted in this paper. Um, it's a, it's also a consideration, or it can lead, or it can lead us to a consideration on that social science is also a debate. It's not. It's not this. You can see that it's not the binary that he mentions, but you can, through his paper, you can you can consider that social sciences is always a debate. Uh, also, the mainstream inside the mainstream is a debate, um, and through this paper, we thought it's important that uh, maybe raising the question of the importance on unifying in an opposition is also important to the debate, and he raises this question. Uh, the need of legitimacy and uh, bringing attention to institutions and bringing attention to the quality assessment discussion uh, is also uh, part of the things that we found interesting. Then the main uh, cons that we found was the, the lack of precision in arguments about the heterodox uh, the lack of precision in his statements about what is progress in, in heterodox, uh, what is advanced, because he loosely said that it has not advanced and it starts from this premise. Uh, and then um, he, he reduces uh, this debate, uh, he, po he, he poses this debate of raison d'être, but he says, uh, he says it loosely, he, he he posted it loosely and reduced it to uh, some guidelines that are the strategies and we think this is not the point and he actually, through this, he misses the point of what is heterodox. Um, uh, so, in our uh, specific questions to the debate, uh, we, we thought of analyzing some questions or uh, that could be interesting, some points that could be interesting. So, uh, why the heterodox label? Like, uh, is it relevant to ask ourselves why the heterodox label, label in academics, in policy making? And uh, in order to ask that question, to answer that question, uh, we have to debate a lot in different aspects uh, because. Um, this, yeah, exactly, this debate has always been there. And uh, we think that the answer would be that this heterodox label is enabling some spaces of discussion that were not there. And for example, we, we talked a lot about this and we think our course uh, is an example of a space of the discussion that, uh, that in that contributes to to say okay heterodox is going somewhere okay that's mainly uh, so going to um, what he calls purpose um, so this is a quote from Hudson's paper and he says that any viable discipline of our school thought should have this 
uh, purpose. And it could be defined as A, the study of a specific zone of inquiry, which seems very reasonable. But then he goes more to say, well, it could be also a particular theoretical approach or a set of analytical techniques or defining problem area. And what, what we thought was kind of um, um, puzzling a bit, it's should a discipline be really defined uh, its viabili viability the same way as a school of thought? I mean, is it not normal and desirable to have many schools of thought? And, and would, we want one de would we want economics to have one particular theoretical approach of one set of analytical techniques or one um, defined problem area? Isn't it desirable that we have many of those? And isn't that plural plurality in itself? And isn't that what we want as heterodox? And um, he uses this framework to try to assess how we as heterodox economists should try to, to find a consensus. And is this consensus desirable at all, in a sense? And well, yeah, in, in a way, isn't this exactly what the mainstream did, you know, um, trying to define economics as this particular theoretical approach that they drew? And why should we do the same? So going more in this direction, he talks about this, um, as Professor Lin has mentioned before, the role of diversity and consensus in science and in the progress of science. Um, so in his view, internal debate is necessary um, for theoretical advance, that's how we get innovations in, in knowledge. Um, but consensus is still the best guide that we have, although consensus doesn't mean truth, it's still the best guide. Um, and then to find this consensus, we need to uh, define the researchers who can define the consensus. So this is also a process of control of who can define the consensus and who cannot, and exclusion of those who cannot um, be in the consensus. So it's, in, in his view, this unrestricted tolerance um, of heterodoxy today, um, it's a failure of quality control. So we need restrictions and we need control to, to assure, uh, ensure quality um, and ensure cons a quality consensus. So we have this trade-off between diversity and consensus, which for him is it's key. And I mean, why? <laughs> you know, like why, why, why this obsession with the consensus? And this is exactly, I think, the problem of the mainstream and, and what they've done. You know, this this necessity to determine that economics is one particular approach, and this consensual view on methodology and one on um, uh, on an approach, and why would we try to do the same? Do we just want to replace the mainstream, or do we actually want to promote something different? And, and to do we want to put new boundaries or to destroy the boundaries and try to have a, an actual diverse and an actual conversation? And this quality actually improve at all with boundaries, or is the possibility to talk and to discuss that will improve quality in the absence of these boundaries? Um, so he he says he defines mainstream as this um, global community of economists who de facto dominate economics within the, acad the academy, who publish in journals of um, most highly ranked by the group, and who populates most prestigious departments. So we could we could also um, see mainstream in, ter in terms of content, right? So we can say it's neoclassical, or even um, it it could also involve more. So this. Um, neo institutionalists or whatever it it could have this um, content definition and this is more of a de facto definition definition <coughs> it's regarding the hegemony of um, the mainstream and this is mainly like his definition is mainly on research but we could also think that in teaching and policy which um, in my opinion is even worse because well in research at least even if it's in other departments we still manage to do re heterodox research in teaching, if people just don't hear about heterodoxy at all, if they don't hear any other opinions, how is, like, what kind of consensus are we building? <laughs> you know, like, is, is this a, a consensus based on exclusion of divergence? Is it a consensus at all? You know, is it, is it valid at all? Is it desirable at all? And with policy as well, we have so many countries in which uh, heterodox policy is illegal, you know, and, and, and in the terms also, you know, this fiscal responsibility, deficits are judicially prohibited, 
um, because this is a consensus, consensus between economists. So why should we look for that? Why, why should this kind of consensus that has to be enforced and is not spontaneous should be desired? And I don't know, we also had some discussions on this, like it's, uh, we don't have a consensus on, <laughs> on this view, but um, I think we wanted to bring this debate as well and to also hear from you what you, what you think of that. And anyway, do we want to replace this hegemony or do we think that maybe having a debate and not having a hegemony would be the best? Um. Uh, thank you, Louisa. I'll just be offering a few comments on your paper and via your paper also on Jeffrey Hodson's paper. Now, the first point that I wanted to kind of bring to focus was the analytical framework that you mentioned Hodson uses, what he calls social epistemology. What I see is like a constant tension between philosophy of science and a history or sociology of science. And indeed, what Hodson proposes is a mix of both these frameworks. And I think that it is this mix that leads to a lot of confusions in his paper. Let me just elaborate what I'm trying to drive here. I mean, philosophy of science has historically been concerned with setting guidelines or normative principles of how science ought to be, you know, in terms of how science ought to progress, whether it's linear, you know, linearly through principles of falsification or through verificationism. On the other hand, you have history of science or the sociology of science, which essentially looks at the practice of science, how science is embedded in communities and the social practice of science. And I think you point this very correctly on the need to focus on social practices as well. So the first question that I would want to pose to Hodgson would be that if he's starting from this framework of social epistemology, where knowledge is acquired collectively through discussion and consensus, how is he then making a claim about quality, which is basically a normative claim? If he's starting from an idea of how the practice of science happens, then how is he making a normative uh, criteria for heterodox economists to meet? And I think here you make the valid point of how Hodgson completely fails to understand the marginalization of heterodox economics. The criteria that he proposes, that is, judging heterodox economists based on mainstream journal rankings or research, I think you correctly point out that it is these very same things that have led to the marginalization. And I think Hodgson completely betrays an understanding of how power in an institutional context works. Having said this, <coughs> the second question that I would want to raise is, does heterodox economics, economics have a normative criterion of quality? I do not see any. I mean, a lot of heterodox economists constantly keep appealing to real world economics. But apart from that simple appeal that we are doing economics, which explains the real world, I do not see more discussion on you know, the normative principles that should guide heterodox economists that as a matter of good science. So indeed, I think that is completely m missing in discussions of heterodox economists. I mean, simply making a recourse to real world economics is, I think, unsatisfactory. And I think what I would like to uh, comment on your paper is it falls into this trap of, you know, because I think on the one hand, it does a good job of identifying real world institutions, practices of how marginalization of heterodox economics happens. I think that is the clear merit of your paper. But I think the danger of that is that it waters down these normative principles of how science ought to be, of how heterodox, heterodox economics as a good science ought to be. So. I think there is that constant tension trade-off between, you know, philosophy, methodology of science, normative principles, and sociology, the active practice of science. And yeah, I think that's 
that's all I think. Okay, thank you. <coughs> The last question that um, I also wanted to raise, uh, maybe because I come from uh, a, a developing country and I, I worked in policy making, um, so I was wondering how this debate contributes to uh, develop or improve economic policy. Um, and uh, and I think this debate on heterodox is important because it's, it's legitimating uh, other positions and different positions uh, and stressing the flexibility that economic policy needs uh, to, to address different uh, uh, aspects of reality. And um, I think uh, the heterodox d debate is uh, also enabling this is these spaces, uh, but at the same time, I think it's it's important, and I I didn't find it in this uh, debate uh, how political power and political institutions um, address and how e economic theory has been uh, used uh, over time through power through institutions. That it's also kind of the Hodgson uh, tradition uh, to address some importance of of this uh, also this contribution to to reality because as uh, economic theory uh, evolves it also it also policy making also uh, it's part of this evolution so uh, yeah that was the last questions we I think we th also have a slide on some other, uh, well, that's it. Oh. If, uh, some other debate that you can really raise. Uh, now I, we will share this. Uh, yeah, it's finished. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, uh, uh, anyone at uh, discussion points? Because this is what we thought that our main specific things of the debate that are still a question that we didn't agree at any point. Just so, of course. I think yeah. your comments are absolutely fantastic. <laughs> absolutely. Do I need this as well? No. Um, and I, I think you really do go to the heart of one of the problems uh, that we have in critiquing debates. Um, I think a couple of points, you know, about, and you've got these here about consensus, but this notion of quality, what does that actually mean? And I think, in a way, how we need to extend the critique of what Hodson has given us is to also fill gaps like he's very silent on, okay, Adopt the orthodoxy, adopt the mainstream measures, but what has that done for policy making? And where is the discussion about power, about institutions, about ideology? So again, it's another big gap. So what you've highlighted is the gaps in my argument in terms of saying what Hodgson has given us. And I think that's the next stage, is to take it further and say, if we go down this path, this sort of perpetuates the worst features of policy making that we've actually experienced and will continue to experience unless we have this sort of debate around these sort of questions. Um, I do like this question about you know science, how, what should science be and how should it develop? And I think we need to have that discussion but maybe we need to frame it in terms that it becomes accessible to a lot more than just us. Because I think that's part of the misunderstanding about a lot of this stuff. And it's seen or perceived as just an academic debate and it's just you know a few of us you know, navel gazing and we're not gonna change the world. And this is why we're gonna make it more and more relevant. Pascal Petit and I had a discussion about the yellow shirts. And I mentioned it before 
we see it like as the tip of the iceberg, fuel tax, and, and it's just tipped people over the edge. So there's all this stuff underneath that is not being discussed. And in fact, the media debate is now, as I hear it, it's all about violent protest. It's not about what caused these people to feel they had to get out and protest. And yes, there was some violence, and I would suggest it wasn't all those protesting that caused it, but it's what caused, and it's policies. And it's like the cumulative effect of a whole lot of changes. And that's where we've got to, I think, take this discussion and debate and make it real world relevant. But at the same time, pointing out the weaknesses of what policy making, et cetera, has been focusing on. But that's all I want to say, because I'd really like to hear everyone else's comments. Mark Lavoie did say you were very smart. <laughs> Not yet, it's too close to New Year's still. Yeah, um, uh, but yeah, my name is Joren, we still say uh, our option always, I think. We are supposed to say this, so I'm Joren and I'm an option B1, which is macroeconomics and finance. And yeah, I studied in Berlin the first year. And yeah, I found it a very interesting um, presentation and discussion, I think. Um, my question is, yeah, in the 1930s or after the Great Depression, there was a, a scientific revolution, or how, like Thomas Kuhn said, like a paradigm change. And, and now in the course of my uh, thesis research, I found a really interesting bibliometric paper, which, which um, looked at keywords and such, and found that after this financial crisis in 07, 08, um, nothing much changed, like a few things we're now not research anymore, but the topical focus of the, of the research hasn't changed. So my big question is, I mean, you pointed towards this, the many bit different things. Why is it that it hasn't changed this time? Um, is it maybe a bit provocat in a provocative way that there hasn't been a big idea like Keynes after the 1930s that has taken over uh, and led to a scientific revolution? Or, or is it that the mainstream is is now really good in 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 taking over heterodox, heterodox ideas, such as um, like claiming ecological economic insights or feminist economic insights for them, um, or is it why is it so different to the 1930s? Um, why can why can we not measure a change yet? Uh, look, I think that sorry, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, Professor Chester, for this presentation. <coughs> so as Louisa said, I'm Louis, uh, I'm from Option B. Macroeconomics and Finance, I studied in Princeton University last year and I'm French. Uh, I have two short questions. The first thing is that what you, your, I mean, your presentation and that of Louisa Morib and uh, <laughs> and Isabel, sorry. <laughs> Isabel, sorry, New Year's Eve is close. Uh, <laughs> and Isabel um, made me think about was uh, Kate Wauer's uh, book on uh, donut economics, in, in which uh, she has quite a good point about the point of economics at all, heterodox or not. Because what I um, what made me think about this uh, this whole debate about quality of research and all about is is economics primarily about doing good research. What I mean is that is not good research an intermediary goal uh, on the way to uh, what I think economics should be, namely uh, a set of guidelines for providing a good life for everyone, uh, a way a broad way to organize society so that we can have all a prosperous life. The second point I want to raise is that what do you think of uh, the recent shifts? Because there, there's been, there, there was a shift or there's been a shift in uh, neoclassical economics for the past few years after uh, the, the words of Thomas Piketty, for instance. What do you think of Piketty's work in the broad shift, at least for new Keynesians and left you know, left wing neoclassicals, in their new focus on inequalities and to what extent that? could make them closer to what we are doing because inequalities has always been a key focus of heterodox economics at all. Thank you. Okay. 
Um, well, I'm a bit short on that one because that was very close to your first question. But uh, I'd like to, to understand uh, maybe on a, something a bit more specific about the, the, like I would agree about that conception of economics which would rather be personally like more of a praxis than a science in itself. But today there's something that really shocks me N nearly every time I read an economics paper, either in uh, uh, orthodox or heterodox, is like the, sh the mix and the sort of like undifferentiated mix between a scientific objective positive work and a normativity part at the end, which is uh, often very decorrelated from uh, like the, the whole scientific work about it. And I, I don't really see the purpose of this. And the idea of like, is it really necessary that that's very linked to the same question to like have this part of normativity behind it. But it's linked also to another question, which you might have heard uh, two years ago, there was a book that was published by Pierre Cahuc and André Zilberberg, I think, two uh, very, very mainstream and very uh, famous economists in France, which was called the economic negationism, basically saying that the uh, heterodox epistemology was basically a negationism globally. And how is it basically possible to frame a debate on epistemology today uh, when you have those kind of reactions, which is like basically saying we it is impossible to discuss between us and it's impossible to chat and we don't want to. Okay, all right. Okay, okay, good. Look, um, really great points and questions. So I start with with yours, um, and this is where I think we've got to remember about historical and cultural specificities. Keynes, the so-called revolution, Keynesian revolution. I mean, Keynes had been around quite a while before that revolution occurred. And when he first started, um, his ideas weren't well accepted. His, for those of you who have read some of Keynes's work, and in fact, all the great economic thinkers, they're not easy works to read. They're muddled. Um, he had developed a reputation as an economic thinker, as an economist, by the end of the First World War. But then he's, he's, um, his, you know, his little publication about um, Versailles and what would it would do to Germany, that didn't win him any friends. But then, I think, coming out of the 1930s, depression, and um, leading into that Second World War, the international community changed their thinking about what they wanted. They didn't want the political unrest that had occurred. So Keynes's ideas became more acceptable in terms of managing the economy. And remember, economies during particularly the Second World War, they were managed. We actually saw the benefits of central planning in most economies because they were directed to the war effort. So there was an accept acceptance about so-called government um, roles, government intervention, that hadn't been there previously. Um, but remember how the 1970s attack on Keynes came when the variables, the economic variables, were not going in the ways that he had previously described they would. So, and, and seriously, the Keynesians at the time could not answer it. So how do we get, um, why haven't we had a change since the crisis of 2007? Power structures, I think, are totally different now. I think the way neoclassicism in particular has become embedded and aligned with public policy was never really there previously. And it is, it is very strong, and it plays a very strong ideological role. And I think that's why we haven't seen it usurped, which comes to the question as, you know, do we try and replace it or not, or do we try and create a strong alternative? But I think the circumstances are different now and we just won't get a repeat. We've had great economic thinkers in the past, but who have we got now? We haven't got a Keynes, we haven't got a Marx, we haven't got a Smith. Who have we got? In the States, in the United States, it was very different with the institutionalists, you know? What's wrong? Do you want an Adam Smith? No, 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 no. Just someone friendly on the science. 
Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> we haven't got a Joan Robinson. You know, we, we don't have one of those leading figures. In fact, if anything, they're more localised in terms of particular countries and particular positions they hold, like Tyrol in France, you know. I mean, he's very influential. Writes letters and what he says goes. Um, so I think when we think about why no change, think about the power structures and the ideology that's actually reinforcing what's occurred with the mainstream and the mainstream how it's become embedded, which um, takes me to the second sort of set of questions because it's, this is where I think the mainstream has got clever about embedding itself. It picks up something and calls it its own but it doesn't take the techniques that come with it. So yeah, embrace inequality becomes a topic, but what are they applying? The traditional techniques of analysis that they've always applied. They're not taking it from an alternative framework and analysing it from an alternative framework. So it's like they re-establish and reinforce their legitimacy by picking up particular analytical topics, but they're not changing. Now, Sheila Dow has written about this quite extensively. Because others have said how neoclassicals have sort of reinvented themselves. And even David Colland has said, you know, oh, they've become a bit more heterodox. They haven't. They're still using the same techniques. They're still very narrowly focused on closed systems. They are not adopting the techniques of alternative approaches from heterodoxy. Um, so I don't see a shift in analytical technique, I see a shift in maybe the topics of analysis on which they might focus, e.g. inequality. Um, I think your question about what is the point of economics is a very good one that we should keep reinforcing. Why do we do economics? I do economic analysis because I want to explain social reality and I want to propose ways to improve outcomes for people. E.g. I focus on what I call energy impoverishment because of what has occurred with energy policies. And I think we've got to remind ourselves it's not just about doing research, that is the intermediary goal, but it's to make society work better. And if we are doing economics for another reason, we should be upfront about why we're doing it. But that's why I do it. Now we probably don't say that often enough, but I think we probably should. Um, you're much more philosophical. Um, I think you're right, and I think probably what you've got to the heart of is that mix of scientific and normative sort of focus. This probably sounds quite arrogant, but this is poor scholarship because people are not explaining why they're merging stuff that shouldn't be merged. And it's, um, you will find this as you write theses and, and basically academic arguments. If, I think if you're not clear as to what you include and what you don't include, it's poor scholarship. And I think that's probably what you're starting to come across is not all academic work is of good quality. A lot of it is of poor quality. Um, I'm not sure about um, what you mean by that French publication because I haven't read it. Um, but you pose the question, how, how or should we frame a debate about epistemology? I don't know if it is about epistemology because most people would not want to engage with that sort of debate and I think we've got to take it outside of like this group and it's got to be wide. So I don't think it's about epistemology, I think it's about saying, look, how do we explain what's going on? And most of what is being explained is just a little partial piece, and that partial piece could be explained differently. Like, I can explain what's happened with the restructuring of energy sectors in a particular way, and the mainstream explain it totally differently. Now, why do I want to explain it in the way that I do? Because I think that explains reality better. But for my argument to have any impact on policy, I also need 
to point out the weaknesses of how the other argument has been posed and why I think I've got a better explanation. So I'm not sure it's about epistemology. I think it goes a bit more to how I use epistemology to explain my social ontology. Does that sort of, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, my name is Sophie. I'm also from Option B, um, Macroeconomics and Finance. And um, I would like to follow up on the discussion and then what you've mentioned earlier with academics having to become real world relevant. And um, after having followed the discussion now, I'm just a bit, I would like to have a bit of clarification on that term because if I think of making academics real world relevant, that would mean from my point of view, shifting the focus, integrating issues we're seeing, like inequality, for example which is exactly what you just admitted the mainstream is doing. So what would you consider making it real world relevant when it's not only shifting the focus of the research so to generate policies that concern broader masses or that pick up what people are doing? And then I wonder whether making economics real world re relevant or academics real world relevant is something that should just happen in this case in the economic research sphere or even this or if it, it is not something that is rather exercised by politicians with the support of economics uh, scholars supporting politics um, with a shift in their, uh, in their focus, in their research focus. And then also the media maybe getting closer to it, shifting the way of how they're reporting about certain things you just were talking about Right, um, violent ri riots, so nothing actually about the underlying problems that are causing this. So, yeah, maybe you could clarify a bit on that. Okay. Yeah, my name is Tore. Uh, I study in Option C, that's development policies, and also studied in Berlin before, where we have a plural uh, economic program which is heavily under attack at uh, its university. And my question goes in the direction of like how the educational system of uh, Europe or in general right now is fitting um, the mold to study plural economics because I think like most undergrads are only concerned with um, mainstream economics and then we have and we we are I think the example we study like for one or two years uh, master programs um, of plural economics but in these um, we have to learn different sets of theories while I say like the, the mainstream economics they um, only study one theory and they get experts in that and we have like a broader knowledge of everything and then it makes it harder to engage in the discussion because um, I think most of the neoclassical uh, papers right now I couldn't criticize them because I can't understand them even though I had some, um, I had some neoclassical uh, education in my program, and then I'm not an expert basically in Marxism. I probably like the most we did was post-Keynesian economics, but there I haven't studied a lot of feminism, uh, feminist economics, and so I think it's very hard and uh, to um, like engage in a real proficient uh, discussion without like maybe an uh, undergrad that's already plural or maybe economics has to acknowledge that it's not enough to study two years of plural economics but it needs four years or something and I would like to have your opinion on that. Yeah, very good point. Uh, hello, thanks for your presentation. My name is Matheus, I'm from Option B also. Um, well, my main point is that uh, you you said at some point that, uh, that in Australia, uh, for example, businesses are telling the, uni the universities which graduates they want, and I was wondering um, more through which channels they do it, if it's simply through lobby on the Minister of Education, through implementation of companies inside the campus, what we have, for example, in Brazil in the technological campus, through think tanks to influence on students' group and participations, or directly on the professors, or yeah, basically how how do they implement okay. it? Yeah. Okay. Me? Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, let me work backwards. Okay. 
Um, because uh, all these questions sort of overlap, but this one's very important because it is about power and how power is used and the different channels. Now, um, and I'll give you the example um, from my own university. And it's partly to do with the governance structure. The chancellor, a woman, is an ex-banker. She worked for the biggest bank, non-institutional um, bank, Macquarie Finance. So you've probably heard of Macquarie Bank. They own lots of things in Europe and UK. No? All right, Macquarie Bank. So she's also on, um, she's a director on a number of boards of very peak Australian companies. So she occupies a big position in business. She was deliberately chosen by the University Senate, their sort of governing body, to be the Chancellor because of her high business profile. Um, she, and because she's got an amazing network, she is one avenue into the university as to when she has dinners and cocktails and board meetings with all those directors out there and they say, oh look, these graduates we're getting, they don't know anything about the real world. The Reserve Bank are invited in to come and talk to, you know, um, the quality of the economics graduates. Oh, they know how to do some modelling but they don't know the real world. So how do we adjust all of this? Well, the university then turns around and revises the curricula so that our students go off and do internships with the Reserve Bank to understand the real world from the Reserve Bank. So there are all these funny little mechanisms that are played, but it is about power. And also, universities compete with each other. They compete for enrolments. So the senior management of the university literally go out to the corporate sector and say, what do you want? What, what skills do you want our graduates to have? And then it's a marketing exercise because the university markets to the prospective student population, we will give you these skills that Australian business want. So we increase the likelihood of you getting a job, a well-paying job, when you graduate. So it's all these sort of and some people would say these are natural mechanisms or, you know, good mechanisms. But it's how its power is used between the structure, the governance structure, the management structure of the university and business. Um, but even the government comes into play because they forecast the skills that the labour market should have for the next 10 to 15 years in this so-called global world that we live in. So it, the joke in Australia, I mean, you know about our resources booms and all that sort of stuff out there in the northwest of Australia. Well, in the 1960s and the 1970s, we trained lots of geologists, lots of geologists, but we weren't training architects or um, medical doctors, but lots of geologists. Well, we trained so many, they couldn't get jobs in Australia. Then sort of business woke up that if they want the skills, they've got to be talking to the universities, telling them what sort of skills that they want. Um, and there's a, a funding thing in here as well. Business fund research centres. We have this uh, amazing medical research centre and it's all about obesity. But guess who funds it? Sorry? Ah, yeah, so they, they come in there. Yeah, they come in there. Pharmaceutical companies. Um, but, you know, um, and companies that um, big, you know, like the Unilevers, that not just sort of detergents, but they're also into food, or the Monsantos. So there's sort of, sort of some oblique relationships, but they look really good. Like they look like they're funding the creation of knowledge, but they've got a vested interest in terms of what comes out of that research. And they, in um, WA, where all the natural resources are being mined, the universities are so closely aligned with those companies, the buildings actually have the name of the company on the sign. This is the Rio Tinto building or the Chevron Shell building. 
because they basically are funded. So they get those really strong links. So then if we're not churning out the graduates, so they're the sorts of channels they use. And you will probably experience similar, did you say you're from Brazil? Yeah. I think there's going to be changes there. Well, you know, you know, before the election, before the presidential election, a lot of my heterodox colleagues, they were raided in their universities. Raided, oh, yeah. uh, police raids, yeah. yeah. Okay, moving along. Okay, so, all right. Um, very good point about how do you critique, how do you become an expert to critique the mainstream when you've spent sort of two years on pluralism in economics? How do you go up against the mainstream? How do you, well, how do you have a credible critique? I turn it around a bit in two ways. Why do you want to do the critique? And the type of critique. And I start with the type of critique. And I wouldn't suggest that any of us try and take on the mainstream in a very theoretical sort of way in terms of perhaps um, <coughs> growth theory as an example. I drill down into more specific research and policy level to make it real world relevant, which comes back to sort of the, the first point. Um, because that's where you will increase the accessibility of your research and your explanation to a much wider group of people. Um, I was trained as an orthodox mainstream neoclassical economist. Um, I still wake up in a cold sweat sometimes in the night thinking, oh God, I'm still dreaming about it. Um, it does get a bit embedded in you, but you can push it aside, but to be to feel comfortable with the expertise of your critique, I think you've got to focus it in a way on real world research and point out how the mainstream doesn't explain what you're trying to explain. I'll give you an example from energy. The mainstream for a long time didn't even acknowledge energy was relevant to any model, but then and this is part of, you know, increasing the, the relevance of the topic. And they thought, oh, climate change, energy, we're going to have to get in on this. So they apply a few models. But they, it's about an input, input to production, yeah. But what about all the implications of the input? Oh, we call them externalities. How do we resolve this? We price it. So it's still abstracting it a bit from reality. And my critique has been, it doesn't deal with it in an adequate enough way. It doesn't explain how you actually um, transform from one energy regime to another one based on a different mix of fuels. So my point in trying to explain that is pick your battles on where you want to do the critique and never feel, as a heterodox economist, you need to be um, so totally conversant with the mainstream that you feel you've got the expertise in the mainstream to critique them. Otherwise, you will end up doing exactly what Jeff Hodson wants you to do, is just engage with the mainstream and have a debate. Now, one of the chapters in this book that he's going to bring out based on the paper that he wrote, he basically argues that our role in life should be debating utility maximisation. Now seriously, do I want to spend the rest of my life debating utility maximisation? And his response to me when I posed this question to him, saying, why do I want to do that? He said, well, it's, it, it, it informs policy. It's embedded in policy now. And I said, yes, but I'm not going to debate utility maximisation. I'm going to debate alternative policy formulations to address that problem and how that will address the problem better than utility maximisation. It's, it's <coughs> deciding whether you're going to debate on someone else's terms or you're going to try and present your contribution to a broader debate that actually can pick up that other debate, but you're not directly responding. You're acknowledging it exists. You're acknowledging that within that narrow framework, 
there could be some legitimacy, but you see it differently. So don't feel disadvantaged. All right, that's basically what I'm saying. Um, which comes back to sort of the real world relevance, the praxis stuff, media. I think the media's got a lot to do with it now. Um, one of the things that I hate doing is media, but I do it. I write articles for online, what I call online newspapers. It's, I think there is there's something developed here in Europe called The Conversation. And it's really, really influential. Short pieces, 600, 800 words, and you turn it into sort of really accessible language. So you use your research to sort of promote debate about particular questions. And that's where I think we also need to get better about extending the focus of our research to the real world relevance. Look, some of us will always be more abstract, more philosophically inclined, but I think we come back to what's the point of economics and the point of our research. And our research might be, make us feel good, might get us great <coughs> academic publications, but then what is the real point? Now, you can see I'm pretty old. I've got a lot of grey hair. That's a lot to do with being an academic, I can assure you. But I decided quite some time ago, because I spent a lot of time before returning to academia in the public sector, when I returned to academia and my research, it would be real world relevant. Yeah, I could do the abstract, but it would be real world relevant. And I always said I would never do research with real people. Guess what I did? Research. I did a huge national study in 2012 on low-income households and energy issues. And it broke my heart. But this was real re world research. And after that huge project, I said I would never do another one with people again. I mean, I'm hopeless as a researcher and, and engaging with real world people, you know, doing interviews and focus groups. Because after they all leave, I cry because it's just they're in terrible circumstances. I'm too emotional as a researcher. Guess what I'm doing again? Another national project on low income households and how I can create accessibility, particularly of low income renting households to solar PV to reduce their energy costs. It's going to break my heart, but this is me trying to do real world relevance but also thinking of ways how I can explain my research and the findings to a lot of people out there that have got no idea about academia or institutions. So it's using social media in different ways. It is doing, unfortunately, radio <coughs> interviews, TV interviews, short online articles, doing blogs. So I think we need to increase our real world relevance by using all those avenues we've now got available, which weren't available to Keynes, even though he did get accepted. But we need to, use, because guess what? The mainstream used the social media in similar ways to reinforce their roles. I'm impressed you do two and a half hour seminars. I can barely keep my students in the room for an hour and a half. <laughs> well, I guess that's because your presentation was so interesting. So <laughs> thanks also from me. <laughs> um, Philip, my name, I study in option C. Um, that is also development policies. And um, uh, yeah, I would, I would like to understand a bit better um, the intention of uh, publishing this paper by Hod Hodgson. Um, uh, so as far as I understand, he's an institutional economist, so maybe uh, um, he uh, sees himself situated um, uh, um, what David Collender calls the edge of neoclassical economics, and that's what for him uh, makes it problematic to self-identify him either as a mainstream or as a heterodox economist. Um, so, so what is it? What does he want to achieve with that? Does he want to um, upset maybe the more radical going to the roots um, approaches that uh, want to uh, that want to uh, revolutionize um, uh, the discipline of economics or is it more like a pitiful um, remark um, uh, 
um, yeah, f by the mainstream on um, heterodox econ a, a waning heterodox economics. Okay. Thanks. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I've been trying to think of how to kind of shorten the question because I have so many like little questions, everything. So basically, um, you were talking about the kind of what it's like in your own department and um, <coughs> as some people mentioned, some of us studied in a university in Berlin uh, and currently um, there's a kind of dispute going on in the university and we're sort of basically the uh, the survival of the kind of heterodox economics modules are being threatened and from like um, my undergraduate as well and I guess for many other people there wasn't even um, any heterodox economists uh, in the department. Um, I was studying in Manchester and I heard about how in the 1990s it was kind of a thriving uh, place of pluralism and discussion in the department but by the time I got there that had completely gone so I guess I want to ask what is how can uh, how can we maintain the pluralism first of all um, and how can we influence universities especially as a students what can we do and then also once we kind of well it's also about the promotion of heterodox econom economics as well um, perhaps actually um, using business or like uh, real world institutions can help us to influence universities and the management in the way they're sort of more business like and focused nowadays is this uh, a possible solution to helping the survival of heterodox economics Yeah, hello, my name is uh, Yannick, I'm also from Option C, which is Development Economics. Um, so my question, uh, we already spoke about it a little bit, targets uh, practical obstacles. And um, at some time ago, but I once uh, saw a contribution about the uh, Mont Pelerin Society. I'm not sure if you know that. Um, so it's ju just a, a network of really uh, rich, influential, political uh, decision makers, uh, people and institutions. And I cannot assess like how deep uh, this uh, network goes, but um, <coughs> yeah, they uh, said it was really severe. So I just want to ask um, if you think that these elite uh, networks are existing to a large extent and if they have uh, really influential um, uh, power and if you think that um <coughs> so even if in um, heterodox economics and plural schools uh, maybe we reach a point where we have better arguments than the mainstream uh, aren't there s still uh, a lot of practical obstacles to um, I mean really uh, make a change in politics and I mean by that because we had that not replacing the mainstream but just opening this field to um, other arguments. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, his intention, his purpose. One of my American colleagues said he's always wanted respectability with the mainstream. He's always been sitting on the edge because he's been in a business school always sitting on the edge, he wants respectability. I think it goes deeper than that because the first chapter of the book, um, when you become published, publishers actually give you sneak looks at things that are going to be published. And I got a sneak look at the table of contents of the book that he'll publish. And his first chapter focuses on Cambridge. Cambridge is where Tony Lawson's developed this sort of particular um, social ontology and basically the title of the first chapter says, you know, there is space outside of Cambridge for these discussions. So, and there's, and there's a bit of intellectual competition between he and Lawson. So I think it's about taking on the notion that only coming out of Cambridge can there be this sort of debate, discussion. Um, and, and Lawson has been very influential in this debate about what is heterodox economics. Um, 
he, Jeffrey Hodson is listed as the keynote speaker in September in Warsaw for the uh, European Association of Evolutionary Political Economy. September, his book will be published. I'd say he's keynote speaker to promote his book. I think he also wants to needle, you know, heterodox economists. He wants to be seen as, given this stage in his career, he wants to be seen as having that role to sort of push heterodoxy along. Um, but I think he's doing it in a way that he's going to antagonise too many people because he's not dealing with past debates and he's not acknowledging past contributions. Um, so I think, I think there's a personal agenda there that's got to do with Cambridge, Tony Lawson, but there's also, I think, he, he sees himself as having a, a role to push heterodoxy along. Um, but I'm not sure that his, his tactics so far are, are going to be welcomed by many people. Um, I think probably he's at an age in his career, he doesn't, he, he won't matter if he feels he gets lots of criticisms. In fact, he'll probably feel his, remember what Veblen said about being disturber of the intellectual peace? He probably feels that is his role to disturb the intellectual peace and, and be provocative. Ah, Berlin, Berlin, Berlin. Um, that's a real conundrum. That is a real conundrum, particularly from the student side. How, how can you um, influence and ensure those heterodox modules are maintained and not um, dissipated? I mean, what I've found, and I've been critical of my own department, as the heterodox economic capacity, what I call it, has been diluted because we've engaged, there's been a vacancy and we've gauged sociologists or political theorists. And with all due respect to my colleagues, they cannot teach post-Keynesian economics in any depth. Yeah, they can pick up a textbook and say, yeah, we can do it. Um, but they can't teach it in any depth or even get to some of those really core now classical propositions. So when you get staff leaving, the mainstream will argue quite clearly, oh, we can do it, we can do it, but they won't do it in the same sort of way. Um, I think there's got to be, though, a debate about how um, well the modules have achieved past results. Now, I've written le letters of recommendation for this program. And I know Mark's argument is it's generated um, such skilled people that are contributing quite um, strongly in very public policy positions. Um, and maybe that's part, got to be part of your campaign as to the relevance of those modules to policy and the skills that those modules actually give those that complete to actually undertake policy development in the real world. I mean, the fact that you're doing programs that enable critical analysis, I mean, most economic students will not, I mean, they're probably skilled in econometric modelling, um, but are they skilled in critical analysis? No. Can they write a research paper? No. Do, do, do they understand the role of all those institutions that we understand make up the economy? Um, can they, do they understand anything beyond the more abstract representation of what international trade is all about and the role of all those? So it's probably about mounting some of those arguments. You need probably to get sympathetic academics on side to help promote the cause. And across the mainstream um, group, there might be one or two, but they may not want to come out publicly because that will ostracise them from their colleagues. Um, I would have thought possibly you could work with some what are called not-for-profits. 
um, to help argue your case as to why you need critical analysis uh, research on real world problems, e.g. trade unions, e.g. Um, social welfare organisations, um, advocacy, consumer advocacy groups, um, and probably independently funded think tanks. And maybe align yourself in ways that you do, you do projects with them that you can actually link to your studies and then you can again argue the relevance of using those heterodox modules to do real world work. You've got hard evidence. But again, use social media, e.g. write, uh, two or three of you, write an article for e.g. an online newspaper like The Conversation or a blog. Um, you could even contribute something. We have a political economy blog that would welcome an international contribution and it's gotten a pretty amazing readership. So mount your case more widely so more people know. May not get you there, but you've got to try as best as possible. Um, practical obstacles, they're everywhere. It's about the channels, it's about the finance, about the power, but when governments change, one of the first things they often do is change the appointments to particular organisations or particular institutions. They embed their thinking into those institutions that work within the economy. We've got to do the same. We've got to create structures that actually challenge some of those embedded. Now, they're very wealthy. Um, and in the States, I mean, a lot of the wealthy people actually pay for economics departments. And that means they pay for a particular way of teaching to be thought. Now, the best way to counter that is to stop having private funds being channeled into educational institutions. But in the States, that will never change because so much is privately funded. So we've got to counter alternatives and we will never have the power and wealth. Well, maybe you might, but I will never have the power and wealth. So again, I think we've got to be smarter and we use our research in a real world like through social media. But it's very, very hard to change those very practical obstacles. And there will be political discontent, as there is in France now. But when you hear the president respond in the way that he has, or what I've heard, I'm not sure he's listening. Or he doesn't want to listen because of other political imperatives. So it's very, very hard, very hard. It's not all doom and gloom, though. I mean, I don't have the answer. <laughs> Good morning, I'm Francesco from Option A, uh, Knowledge and Innovation Policies. Thank you for your presentation. And uh, what I would like to ask you is on the success point, like uh, how would you define it? And you say that it uh, should be measured against the evolution of the uh, heterodox economics project. And like, uh, how would you uh, measure it to avoid the risk of being uh, self-referential uh, on one hand and on the other hand uh, defining heterodox economics just in opposition to the neoclassical uh, one. Okay. Hello, I'm Jan, from also from Option A, uh, Knowledge and Innovation. Um, I think we agree that uh, Hoxton is uh, like trying to impose uh, a way of doing science, uh, but I would like to know a bit more about your, because we have seen like his opinion about it, and I would like to know a bit more about your opinion how to do it. And you mentioned uh, like m making a better explanation compared to uh, mainstream, 
and what do you mean with better explanation and how what what defines a better explanation and if the objective of science of science is making explanations okay uh, okay thank you for your presentation it was really That's all right. <laughs> you're all very kind <laughs> Hello, my name is Hannah. I'm from Option B, Macroeconomics and Finance. Um, I would like to come back to something you touched upon really f quickly, which is the political philosophy that underlies economics. Um, I wonder if this is the actually boils down to the real difference between the different school of economics or like pluralism versus mainstream economics. Um, because I think Hot Hutchinson said that Mainstream economics is politically neutral, and I think you disagreed. Uh, if we can also say, on the other hand, that all pluralist economists are truly leftist, is a question. If this is really the difference between all these schools, and so what the role is of politics actually also in um, the importance of the schools, maybe in the different countries. So, with a change in the political situation, if there can be a change in, in also the uh, teachings of economics and they also, I guess, relate to it, the financing of educational institutions, if this comes from the business schools, which then leads to the politics and then to economics. Okay. You are right? Okay, right. Okay. Um, I think the first and second are sort of a bit related. Um, you've gone to the heart of my next project. Is, is actually establishing legitimate, what I call legitimate criteria to judge or evaluate or assess the so-called success of heterodoxy. And I, my thinking at the moment is this, is that what is the project? What's the purpose? And I see it as a multiple purpose, but it's reflected through different schools. So it's quite, and I would suggest that different schools, each of the different schools need to be judged in order to form an overall conclusion about the advance or lack of progress or lack of so-called quality of heterodoxy. But it goes back to that core question is, how is knowledge, adva knowledge advanced? And this sort of touches on the last question is the creation of knowledge will depend on your political philosophy, how you view capitalism, how you view change. And some schools are stronger in terms of observation, some less so. So it depends on your epistemology reflecting that philosophy because that philosophy will also suggest different roles for government, different political rhetoric. Um, I think it is, it is hard for a heterodox economist to set up how do we judge heterodoxy and that's why I think it has to be um, a project of a number of colleagues and a number of colleagues that would be viewed across the spectrum of heterodoxy. So the first step may be five or six articles debating on how do you judge the advancement of a group of schools of economic thought that really grew out of opposition from the mainstream. It's a very difficult one, um, but I think we've got to have that debate because unless we have that debate or start it, we will end up falling back into responding to all the other critiques of heterodoxy. Um, and it, it sort of goes also to the earlier point about quality. I think quality is the wrong starting point. Um, I think it goes back to what's, what's the purpose or what's the analytical focus, um, say with feminist economics. Now across feminist economics, you get an amazing spectrum of schools of economic thought. So what's been the purpose? Now I see it as having generally, irrespective of school of economic thought, as having quite a strong policy role, quite a strong um, 
role to advance understanding and hence change in terms of relevance to women and relevance to understanding patriarchy. But I think it's quite a complex project to do and I don't think it can be judged just up there. I think it's got to be judged across different schools of economic sort. And that to me advances how do you, um, better is not for me, it's like quality, I'm not sure. A more robust explanation, an explanation that probably is more complex to explain reality. And that's, it's very easy for media and the mainstream to focus just on one aspect. It's very simple, just do one aspect and forget about all those other things that actually impa impact on that aspect. But that's exactly what the mainstream do. They excise out this little bit and say, okay, we're gonna analyze that, but it's taking it out of reality. That makes the analysis a lot more complex, a lot more difficult. But you've got to be prepared to do that. And once you've done it, you've got to be then prepared to make it accessible in a way to a lot more people outside of your immediate academic focus. And that's the huge challenge we've all got. How do we do that complex analysis but then how do we make the results of that analysis very accessible to other people if we're gonna change thinking about what are the best explanations um, to inform policy? Um, political philosophy underlying economics. Um, my big first year unit that I teach, it's an introduction to sort of political economy. Um, they're young, they've just come out of high school. And I say political philosophy and they go, <coughs> um, they think economics is just like they've been taught in high school. So I give them literally um, what I call a grid. It's about 10 things. Um, and what they've got to discern with every school of economic thought is theory of knowledge, political philosophy, role of government, policy implications, analytical concerns, key concepts to be able to compare and contrast. And by about week 13, they can actually see underpinning each school of economic thought, there is a very different attitude towards power and role of government. And it boils down to, you know, well, do you see government as being active or having a role? Because that informs policy prescriptions. But the other thing that comes out is the disconnect between what neoclassical economics maintains and what actually occurs. And they're quite shocked by that. Now I just use that as an example because I think we do have to keep coming back to explaining the political philosophy underpinning each school of economic thought. And my colleagues and I have probably not been as good as we could be as explaining it. And I don't think we should be ashamed of explaining the different political philosophy underlying economics or any school of economic thought. And I think we do need to go back into that debate about the ideological role that economics has played and will continue to play. Because it's now quite strong but it's not being discussed. And that's why we haven't had a shift since the crisis of 2007 and eight. Okay. Pleasure. Now, can I just ask something of all of you? See, I see you as the future of heterodoxy. So when I do my projects with my colleagues, can I get a mailing list so I can invite you to make contributions? Even if we set up blogs or something, just from different perspectives from a very, you know, eclectic group of scholars. I'd be really, really pleased. But I thank you for the opportunity of being here and being so engaged. I'm so impressed, two and a half hours. I'm going to tell my students about you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you.